work better together. Um, and uh, I can be the voice for our community. I've done it before. I've done it for our communities within um, all of the places I work at. Thank you, Sylvia. Sure. Hi, I'm Jimmy Nguyen. I'm running to be your San Jose City Council member because I love this community. And I want to be your humble public servant. I've lived in this area for about 30 years. I went to Evergreen Elementary, Quimby Oak, and Silver Creek High School. Because of the great educational opportunities here, I was able to go to college and graduate from law school. During that time, I also had an experience working with at-risk youth, kids who were at risk of dropping out or joining gangs, and this opened my eyes to a need out there in the community for people who care and can advocate for people who can't speak for themselves. During this time, I also found that donating blood was important to me. I've donated blood a few times a year for about eight years now. Part of my public service is also serving on the water board, the Santa Clara Santa Clara Water District Independent Monitoring Committee for it. That allowed me to learn about our water issues, what needs to be done to fix that infrastructure, and also that there are other ways to help our communities. Lastly, I served on the San Jose Evergreen Valley College $500 million bond oversight committee because I care about education and fiscal responsibility. Uh, with that experience, I learned that there are local issues here in San Jose, not just um, for the greater valley, but also in our district. Thank you, and I appreciate your support, November 8th. Okay, you're next. Okay. I'll stay seven. Oh, you're gonna squelch me, huh? All right, um, in one minute, would you please explain why, why you've chosen to run for city council? To reiterate what I said earlier, uh, I grew up in this area, I uh, care a lot about it, it gave me a lot of opportunities, to be successful today, and I feel that I owe a debt to this community to serve and uh, be a public servant. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> District 8 has been my home for the last 15 years, and so it's where um, my husband and I are raising our children, our two wonderful children. It's where we own a home. It's uh, where I work as an Evergreen School Board member. And it's also where we, at times, struggle, just like many other families living in this valley. Um, you know, I was raised in a family that honored serving one another. And I really took this family value and made it into my career, um, and which has led me ultimately into public service. And so I want to make sure that our streets are safe one more time, um, that uh, our retired community has um, all some options to keep a healthy and independent lifestyle um, so that our that our children can play in the streets without fear of uh, cars uh, speeding too fast in our uh, in our streets and lastly to really provide our youth with opportunities. Well timed, thank you. Um, so Sylvia, this one I'm going to do, uh, and this is a short one, 30 seconds, can you please uh, name your top endorsers or the ones you're most proud of? Sure, the, the ones I'm most proud of is uh, Supervisor Dave Cortezzi, um, his wife Patty Cortezzi as an Eastside Union High School uh, District uh, trustee. I'm endorsed by Dawn, which is the Democratic uh, Women Involved uh, Association, uh, the Teachers uh, Evergreen Teachers Association, uh, three other uh, supervisors on the county, Council Member Magdalena Carrasco, and uh, various of our neighborhood associations on the other side of Capital Expressway, Meadow Fair, and uh, Tully Alcoholic. My endorsements are Assemblymember Kansen Chu, uh, Councilmember Johnny Camus, uh, Councilmember Tam Nguyen, uh, Councilmember Man Nguyen, the Citizens for Fiscal Responsibility, the Chamber of Commerce, and if I haven't said it already, the Santa Clara County Democratic Club. Thank you. Um, now let's get into the meat of, of policy and, and the issues that we all face. Um, so the first question is going to be a two-minute answer, and it has to do with Measure F. What is your position on Measure F, and how will you help to ensure that our neighborhoods are kept safe? Jimmy, we'll start with you. Measure F is a 
settlement between the city and the unions that puts to rest the pension reform issue of 2012. Uh, it is something that the city and the unions, after so many years of, of uh, conflict, have agreed upon. And they say, we, if we put that in, we can save, I believe, roughly $30 million a year for the next 30 years and enact pension reform and health care uh, benefits that is sustainable for the city. It also sends a message to possible recruits and city employees that we get along with each other now and we've put behind the conflict. And uh, the second part is how would I help? Yes. How would you help ensure that our neighborhoods are kept safe? Yeah. Well, we need more police and fire, uh, especially police officers. One thing a council member can do to help recruit more officers is join the recruiting team and uh, show the public that we're working together now and we don't have these conflicts that we had over the past few years. As someone who uh, believes in co collaboration and involving a lot of people in the process, if we do that, we can send a message to possible recruits that San Jose is a warm place for police and firefighters to come and work and uh, we, we uh, support our employees. So I do support Measure F. I think uh, it's time for us to really put this pension uh, reform, all of the tension that is created, really behind us and let everyone uh, know uh, up and down Northern California that we value our police officers and that we value public safety. We've had many, many instances, especially on next door, um, of continued burglaries, um, one week after the primary election, uh, my neighbor in my backyard um, had his home burglarized as my children played in our side of uh, our backyard. Two o'clock in the afternoon. So it's really brazen, really bold. Um, and so we need more bodies out there. Really, our police department is doing a wonderful job with what they have. The reality is we need more bodies out there. Um, and I think Measure F will help start rebuilding our police department, um, reinstating our traffic <coughs> enforcement unit, and in general, I think uh, creating uh, some great morale for our police officers. Um, it's, it's difficult when uh, you're not valued um, with your pension and pay, especially when you're risking your life. And I know this is a, is a tough career. Uh, my, my sister is a police officer in Oakland, um, so she's got a tough job. And you know, I really respect what she does on a daily basis. And I uh, wanna make sure that I respect our police officers here in San Jose as well. So, then we'll start with you, Sylvia. Uh, this is like suburban San Jose, and we have some extraordinary schools around here uh, that we're all happy on. And happy with and enjoy, but getting to and from the schools is often fraught with frustration. What are your thoughts on improving traffic flow in the district and especially safety around our schools? One minute, please. Sure. Oh, so you turned me off. <laughs> you don't want to wind up. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to start over, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So we have a walk-in roll program um, that, that is administered by the city of San Jose. We have it in our Evergreen School District and it's been really successful. And so it's aimed at encouraging a healthier lifestyle, spending you know, parents walking or uh, biking uh, our children to school and really reducing the congestion. Um, it also goes hand in hand with creating some awareness for our drivers to look out for our students as they're walking to, to and from school. And so I think the, the solution is really going to be, um, it, it's going to be really different for each of the schools. In our school, what we did is we created a third lane allowing two-way traffic to still exist. And so that pick up and drop, drop off time was more efficient and less congested for our neighborhood. And I think that the Department of uh, Transportation can do this kind of assessment to each of our schools. Thank you. <clears throat> One thing we can do to alleviate traffic is to support our public transportation system. Uh, on the ballot is a measure A for the county tax, uh, excuse me, bond. 
If we improve our public transportation system, perhaps we can get a lot of people out of their cars, lessen our carbon footprint, and uh, you know, uh, allow people to get to know other people when we try to ride public transportation. About safety around schools, in the last few months, my team and I have gone to local schools to give out coffee in the morning, reach out to parents. I see some people who uh, have come to our, our uh, table to have some coffee and conversation about what's happening here in District 8. So, uh, ironically, some of these same parents are parents who are speeding in these school zones when they drop off their kids. And uh, some of them also talk about the lack of safety. So, I find it ironic, but anyway. A lot of the schools have one or two crossing guards. Some of them, might. I think we should have two crossing guards. So that is one way we can help with the school safety. Thank you. Let's talk about the city's budget a little bit. You know, they've got $3 billion roughly in total spending and a billion dollars in uh, discretionary general funds. Um, do you think that they're being spent efficiently and effectively? And what, if anything, would you change about what the city is spending its money on and how it spends it? And we'll start with you, Jimmy, and you get two minutes. I'm sure with three billion dollars, there's some leakage somewhere out there. I mean, um, and, and priorities change from year to year. So if uh, our auditing team can look into the resources, uh, how our money is spent, and pay attention to it, as well as council members and their staff, perhaps we can eliminate some of the, the leakage. I'm not saying there is any, but inefficiencies that exist in all large organizations. And when you're talking about $3 billion in a city of 1 million people and something like 3,000, 3 to 5,000 employees, there are probably things that we can do better. Uh, and we should maintain uh, some diligence on that year to year. Do you have any concrete examples of what you would recommend changing? Recently, Something that made the paper is the San Jose Police Department went to Hawaii to recruit police officers at a cost of roughly $50,000. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the best use for our money, and, and not as someone with direct experience, but it's something that raises alarm bells for me. $50,000 to Hawaii or $50,000 here locally in California to recruit people who could just drive into our, our city or we could drive to, to meet these recruits makes sense. So th that's one example. All right, Sylvia, so what, if anything, would you change about the way the city is spending their funds? And are they being spent efficiently and effectively, and, and how would you help improve things? Well, every public institution needs to uh, continually take a look at how they're spending money and creating more efficient and effective uh, ways. Um, and certainly when, we, uh, when the economy is down, we really tighten our belts, right? And just like our families do, um, and uh, when the economy is uh, is well, uh, this is when we need to start living within our means. Uh, but also, growing back some of the programs that have been missing, and so the programs that have a high rate of return. And I'm talking about after school programs, um, which are relatively low cost for the rate of return that we get from them, and especially around public safety. So it keeps our children off the streets, keeps our burglary rates down, keeps truancy down, offers uh, you know, some opportunity and benefits for, for development for our children, and, it, and it's a direct uh, impact on public policy. I mean, I'm sorry, on public safety. And so I would continually look at for programs that have high rate of returns um, in order to make the best use of our budget. Um, I think something that I'd like to see uh, a little different is having quarterly audits and so that we can take a look at some of the programs and how they're doing and if they're running efficiently and if they're not, let's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> let's make some changes and not at the, <coughs> at, at the end of the year, but you know, throughout the, uh, on a quarterly basis. Thank you. Um, one, one of the, more polarizing issues in this district lately has been uh, the Evergreen, San Jose Evergreen Community College District's uh, proposal to rezone 27 acres of land over by uh, San Felipe and Yerba Buena. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think like everyone else, we um, 
we have to be very careful um, and take a look at the impact that new development has around our neighborhood. The traffic impact, the impact it has on quality of life, um, and, uh, and infrastructures. Uh, and so it's, these are some of the things that I'm considering as I'm learning more about this development. And, um, and I think once, once I completely study this project, I will be able to say whether I oppose it or not. Um, we have to be very careful about the type of, if it's retail, what type of retail are they bringing in. Um, and just be really responsible about bringing growth into Evergreen and make sure that it makes sense for our community if, if in case it, it does happen. Jimmy, same question. Evergreen uh, Valley College property. Like many people here in this room, uh, I share your concerns about the development there at Evergreen Valley College. I am happy to say I agree with you. We should not develop that land for commercial purposes. Uh, educational land is limited out there, and I'm happy to say that I, I support education and I want to improve our educational offerings here in District Bay. Uh, there are many people who say that kids here on the east side drive all the way to De Anza College, and we have a perfectly good community college down the street. Why would we waste that resource? So, no, I, I don't think we should develop that land for commercial purposes. We should keep it for educational purposes. So we'll start with Jimmy this time. Where do you stand on the issue of development in Coyote Valley? We have a green belt over there. I don't know how far it reaches into Coyote Valley, but it, it's nice to have a green space like Coyote Valley. Uh, uh, our city is growing, the core is growing. And if we can concentrate our development in downtown and then uh, stagger the rest of it, it's nice to have a green space like Coyote Valley out there. I also think that we shouldn't develop in, in Coyote Valley. We also have endangered species out there that we need to make sure that we protect. And open space always adds to the quality of life of our families and our community. And so I would aim to protect that. Okay. So that being said, um, housing affordability is a big issue in San Jose uh, today. What would you do to, uh, to help resolve the issue of housing affordability within San Jose? Sure, so affordable housing is uh, really important and uh, Measure A is going to help us um, uh, create some stock, housing stock for our most vulnerable population as we'll give it some opportunity for um, <coughs> first time home buyer options for um, working families. And so our homeless population has really changed. Um, their faces have changed. It's no longer our veterans. It's no longer folks who have mental health issues and are just uh, maybe straight bound. But there are families who are getting outpriced because it's just so expensive to live in this valley. Um, I've been talking with folks as I knock on doors and, and talk about the importance of Measure A. Um, and supporting uh, that affordable housing as the, the first real option that we have. Uh, yeah, to do with what, what would you do to help ameliorate the problem of affordable housing within uh, San Jose, provide more affordable housing? Number one, and I misspoke earlier, I think I said measure A when I should have said measure B for the tax measure, but on this housing question, the housing bond that's about $950 million on the ballot, uh, that's one way our local leaders have said that we, we can help people who are homeless, veterans, and uh, possibly even teachers with the affordable housing problem. So if we pass that, we're supposed to get something like three to 5,000 units online to address that issue. Another thing we can do uh, is make it easier for developers to develop in the core of San Jose so we have more housing, dense housing, near public transit lines. It's an efficient way to build housing without impacting the surrounding areas, traffic-wise and so on. Uh, so, one, the uh, affordable housing measure, bond, excuse me, and two, uh, develop high density in the core near transit lines so that we don't impact traffic. All right, driving around the district, uh, there seems to be a fair amount of empty retail space. Uh, a couple of large uh, uh, grocery store pads and, and uh, the Walgreens over at Evergreen Village. 
square to swing the mine, um, as well as a general complaint about a lack of, of available dining options within within uh, District 8. Uh, you have two minutes or so to, to tell, tell us what your plans are for attracting more businesses and for uh, encouraging retail development within the district. As a council member, not only do we pass policy uh, and help over conflict, we're also the cheerleader for our district and city. And as a council member, I take that into account uh, driving around the area, and we all know Safe Mart and Safeway down here, as well as some of the other storefronts are vacant. So knowing we have this capacity, a council member should go out there and tell businesses, you know, the big ones, the small ones, the mom and pops, that we have these spaces here and we want to get you in them. What do you need from me or the district or the city in order to make that happen? So uh, that, that's one of the best ways a council member can help with these empty storefronts. Be the, the advocate, the cheerleader to say, we have a nice area here with great stores. We want to help you start a business here. What do you need from us? So the Health Trust recently did a study in this area and um, they released a report that reflected that we have a food desert in our district. We are one of the districts that has the highest medium income and yet we have a food desert because our businesses continue to close. And you know for folks who are retired and sometimes a little bit bound to our district, it doesn't really provide a lot of options. Um, and so I think the city needs to really take a look at the planning, the permitting process, and how they're supporting small business owners. And especially uh, those business owners that have, uh, that are culturally different, that provide some of that diversity and um, great dining options uh, for our community. Um, my father, um, when I was growing up, he opened up a restaurant, and he did not have the support um, and the know-how from from a, from somebody who might know better, right? Somebody who's gone down that road, a business owner that could be an advocate um, and a champion for uh, rising um, small business owners. And so eventually, uh, that restaurant shut down, but. <clears throat> but it is the small businesses that really provide uh, the majority of jobs in this county, and we need to make sure that we're supporting them just as much as we're supporting big business. Thank you. So speaking of big business, one of the best things that we can do to reduce commutes is to get businesses located closer to, uh, to residences. And by businesses, I mean commercial uh, and industrial, not, not residential and or not uh, retail in this case. We've got excellent space down by uh, Lawson Hill and 101 in the Hellier Business Park. What can be done to attract more businesses into that area? The, the question is what can we do to attract more businesses down into the, uh, the Lawson Hill 101 Business Park area? Uh, sure. So I, I think the mayor is doing a wonderful job in reaching out to big businesses. I think um, that is definitely a strength. And with big businesses, we also need to be responsible and make sure that we have the housing stock to, to match, right? So we need to make sure that we're growing responsibly and that we're not adding, adding to our traffic congestion that is already um, so horrible and uh, damaging our, our streets um, with more potholes. So, you know, I personally uh, would make sure that um, that I visit the other other cities that have in, in ways that um, that I can learn their strategies on how to bring in more businesses into that area. Maybe creating some incentives for for big businesses, um, and at the same time, small businesses or or folks who are having mid-sized uh, companies because those are the folks that can really grow um, larger than maybe some of the, you know, some of the Yahoo's and, and uh, Facebook's. Um, and so I think we need to give a chance to, to all different levels of, of business and not just um, focus on, on the large ones. So um, being able to champion um, the safety of our city and the, the beauty of our city 
um, and really attract talent um, is, uh, is another strategy um, because San Jose is definitely a place um, to live. It's fun and, uh, and, it's, and, uh, and it's very happening. We're far from the city center, but it, once you get in there, it's very um, active. Encouraging businesses to locate down in the Eden Valley Business Park by Blossom Hall 101. Well, similar to the, my answer in the last question, you know, how do we fill businesses or get businesses to co come down to that area? The same way we would for District 8. We tell these people, um, we have these resources. Uh, what do you need to move down here? What, what is it about this area that makes it better than, say, Santa Clara or Palo Alto? Uh, in South San Jose, if you head south on 101, you won't have the, the traffic problem. If we improve our public transportation infrastructure, people will take the train down that way as well. Um, but it comes back to being a council member who advocates for his district. If we have these resources that no one knows about these other companies, somebody has to go out there, reach out to them, say, hey, we have these businesses, come on down. How do we make it happen? What do you need from us? Is it public transportation? Is it uh, tra traffic uh, alleviation? Is it affordable housing? Or is it just uh, the fact that you don't know about the place? Maybe that's the reason. But a council member should advocate for their district. Know what resources we have here, what we can offer people, whether locally or you know, Palo Alto. Maybe they don't want to deal with the, the headache uh, of all that traffic in that area. That's something we can solve. Drive down this way, you'll go in the opposite direction of traffic, you won't spend an hour. All right, thank you. Um, that, uh, that location. The land up above Evergreen Valley property, the bird land, that's currently zoned commercial industrial, would you ever consider supporting, uh, changing the zoning of that to residential, and if so, under what circumstances? I'm happy to consider it, but uh, San Jose has a jobs housing imbalance. That means that for every unit of housing we put out there, we are losing money. So does it make sense to change industrial commercial land to residential land? Not at this time. But I am happy to consider it. Maybe some factors come along that says, okay, it's a good time, a good idea to change it. But at this time, I think it's best for us to keep it as is, to focus on um, the housing jobs and balance. I would also support to keep it at the zoning that it's at right now. Um, I think that uh, our housing options um, should be applied everywhere else. Um, and uh, I know that we are focused on urban villages. Um, so, you know, not uh, growing, growing up instead of um, taking a lot of our space and being really efficient with retail and housing and uh, in transit oriented places. And so, Unfortunately, that area is not transit-oriented friendly. And I would worry about the traffic impact it would have if we actually changed the zoning to, to housing. So I would, I would keep it as is. Okay, thank you. Thank you both very much for your answers. Now we'll go into your uh, closing statement. we we'll start with you, Jimmy. You have two minutes. Two minutes, right. Thank you to the District Gate Roundtable, to Pat for hosting, and you good folks for taking your time out here on a Thursday to come out and listen to, to us. Um, if it hasn't come through clearly now, I'm a person who values collaboration and involving many stakeholders into the decision-making process. I believe in taking as much, as much information as possible to make the right decision for all of us. As a council member, I'd be happy to listen to as many of you as possible as I walk out the precincts uh, and uh, talk to roughly 45,000 people from now until 33 days, November 8th. Um, but even after that, it's important for me to represent the people that I, I'm reaching out to. You good folks and all the other voters who take their time out to vote and participate in our democracy, you have a voice and sometimes you might feel that it's not heard, but it's important for me to talk to all of you, get your opinions, and whether we agree or not, at least I heard you, and I'll try to represent your interests at City Hall. Thank you. Sorry.
Just hold your applause until Sylvia's done. Thank you. So my father and my mom uh, were immigrants to this country. My dad worked at as a bracero for many years um, until he had the option to be naturalized in this country and brought uh, some of his family over. I was the first one born and raised here, 42 years. Yeah, that's how old I am. <laughs> and, and I've been very fortunate to be living here in Evergreen for 15 years. And so my parents really changed the course of my life when they made the choice to immigrate and take that risk um, and change their home uh, to California. And so I'm really grateful for that opportunity. My parents are from very humble beginnings. Um, my dad was a cook before he retired, uh, and yet he was a homeowner three times. He facilitated home ownership to me in a wonderful neighborhood. And so my parents really uh, transferred a really hard work ethic that I've taken into account throughout my whole career. I've worked really hard to be where I'm at. I have a master's in public administration that really helps me understand public policy and public service. Most importantly, my heart is really in the community. I want to make sure that our streets are safe, that our children are thriving, that our businesses um, have, that our businesses are full and there aren't any empty storefronts. And so all of my experience has led me to believe that we need somebody at City Hall who will do their homework, who will listen, and will take all of that information and create some wonderful opportunities for our neighborhoods. I'm that person, and I would like to be your voice at City Hall. I've done it in many different arenas, as a school board member, and now at City Hall. Thank you. Um, thank you both, Cameron.